Thank you, David Freeman, uh, for that humorous yet sobering, sobering yet humorous uh, account of our, uh, the dangers facing us in climate policy. Uh, our next speaker is a former tax lawyer from Washington, D.C., and a visiting professor at Mount Holyoke College, where he taught Winners and Losers, a seminar on U.S. tax policy, as well as a seminar on poverty. He's in the process of preparing materials that will be free online, uh, which, will teach, uh, which will be for high school teachers uh, to teach students about the federal income tax, the federal corporate income tax, and one on Social Security and Medicare. Uh, he is the author of If Americans Really Understood the Income Tax, as well as 10 Tax Questions the Candidates Don't Want You to Ask. John Fox, welcome. Well, thank you very much. First of all, it's really a privilege to be here to hear these marvelous speakers. Uh, so I'm delighted this conference is going on. I want to talk to you this morning about a topic dear to my heart that strikes fear in the hearts of most Americans, taxation. And I want to tell you about talks I've been giving over the last two years, which may lead you to think, John, are, are you really serious? Uh, but I am. Uh, for the last two years, I've been uh, giving talks to high school juniors and seniors in U.S. government and economics classes about how to think about a fair and sensible individual income tax. Okay, now you can smile. But the, the fact is that the teachers find it very useful. They tell me they wouldn't have any idea what to teach and yet they learn that so much of my talk is relevant to what they do teach. Best of all, they tell me that most of the students, not all of course, but most of the students get it. And the other thing is, it's really fun to do. Now I've been giving these talks because I'm convinced that the dreadfully low level of political dis discourse, excuse me, discourse and debate about tax issues uh, is attributable in good part to the failure of our education system to address it. And this has left the public uh, uninformed and so vulnerable to almost anything the politicians say about it. And I believe this is more than just a major failure in our civics education. I believe it's dangerous. So in the few minutes I have with you, here's what I tell students uh, in the course of an hour. Taxes fund the agencies and operations of the federal government, but they do much more. Federal tax policies help shape who we are as a nation and what we will become. They touch upon nearly every aspect of our lives. Just think about all those provisions in the tax laws. Healthcare, housing, education, jobs and businesses of every kind, Marriage, divorce, death, children, childcare, charities, charitable giving, the environment, on and on and on. In my view, except for the US Constitution, federal tax policies collectively represent the most comprehensive expression of American values. Yes, I tell the students, your personal well being and that of our nation depends upon sound and sensible tax policies. And I tell them, if you pay attention for this one hour, you will know more about tax policies than 99.7% of all Americans. Maybe 99.4%, I'm not sure. So why focus on the individual income tax? For two reasons. First of all, it by far produces the greatest revenue to fund all government programs other than Social Security and Medicare. What about the corporate income tax? Now, the individual income tax produces more than four times the amount of the corporate income tax for all sorts of reasons that you can imagine. Uh, secondly, the individual income tax has become something of a monster. An ideal income tax would be reasonably fair, reasonably simple, and economically sound. But our income tax is frequently unfair, unimaginably complicated, as you know, and an excessive drag on the economy. Americans need to understand why 
and the imperative to fix it. Now, why is it such a monster? Because it attempts poorly in most cases to do much more than collect taxes on our income. Now, while it imposes progressive tax rates that run from 10% up to 39.6%, those tax rates apply only to taxable income. And the fact is, and you don't hear this generally, only about half of all individual income is subject to tax. More than 100, well more than 100 tax breaks shelter the other half of all individual income. And that means that last year, close to $7 trillion of individual income went untaxed. And I did say trillion. And in general, those tax breaks don't make social or economic sense. Now, when I refer, refer to income, I'm referring to any form of economic gain, whether direct, such as salaries or fringe benefits uh, at work, which I will be talking about in a moment. When I refer to a tax break, I'm not talking about the ordinary and necessary expenses that businesses are entitled to in order that they be taxed appropriately on their profits. I'm talking about special relief involving our personal lives unrelated to any trade or business. Now, a fair tenant of a, a basic tenet of a fair tax is one that taxes people in accordance with their ability to pay. And that would mean that people in households of equal size with equal incomes would pay roughly the same. But far too often, our tax burdens depend on our ability to avoid taxes, not on our ability to pay them. You see, under our tax system, you, your actual tax bill, uh, liability, whether you are a winner or loser, depends in good part on the number of tax breaks and the size of those tax breaks uh, that you're entitled to. So here are three principal examples. We'll have winners and losers, uh, and they're somewhat simplified. But winners work for employers who pay all sorts of fringe benefits for them. Health insurance premiums, life insurance premiums, disability in insurance premiums, contributions for childcare, and handsome contributions to retirement plans for them. Thousands and thousands of dollars never appear on their tax return, even though you know they have real economic value. The loser works for a, an employer who pays perhaps the same total compensation, but all his salary. So all of it appears on her tax return. Second, a winner owns her own home or his own home, and perhaps a vacation home as well, and deducts the interest on both homes. For example, the the winner might own a principal residence that, that he bought for $650,000 or, or borrowed $650,000, borrowed $350,000 for the ski condominium. Deducts the interest on that. Also deducts all the property taxes on any number of homes, even five or six vacation homes. The loser rents, rents her house or apartment. And the loser doesn't even get a deduction for any part of that rent. Third. A winner receives a good deal, often, of his income from investments, from investments in stocks and mutual funds, which receive a favored tax rate. The loser, she works. Her income is from salary, and all of that income is subject to progressive tax rates. Now, just because it's a tax break doesn't mean it's bad, but it does mean that we ought to ask, why is it there? Who benefits from it? Who doesn't? Who are the winners? Who are the losers? What are the social and economic costs? What are the outcomes? Indeed, most of these tax programs, most of these tax breaks are the equivalent to government programs. They're simply channeled through the tax laws. Now, here's a major difference. If a government program exists, it has a budget, and it must be reviewed annually by the federal government, by the particular congressional committee. Tax breaks have no budget and they never have to be reviewed unless some committee requires it. Notice the relationship between tax breaks and tax rates. The more income that escapes taxation, the higher tax rates have to be for everyone. Simple example, if the government needs to raise $20 of revenue for every $100 of income, a flat 20% rate would suffice if all $100 were eligible for the tax. 
but if only half of our income, $50, is subject to tax, you need a rate of 40%. So, this is so important because the vast majority of tax breaks provide the greatest ta tax savings for people with the highest income. Let me demonstrate this with two major examples. And these are things that we take for granted and we all tend to believe in them. Health insurance premiums paid at work. Um, as so many of you know, those premiums, no matter how high for the most Cadillac of all policies, are not subject to income tax or social security tax. Even though they are clearly a form of income, you know that if the employer paid you that amount of money and you paid the insurance company, it would be the same economic result. But they're off the charts. They never, no matter how large, appear on your tax returns. So listen to this. Over the next five years, uh, estimates are that something like $740 billion of tax savings will result from the exclusion just of health insurance premiums at work. Now that's a big program. And I think we should be asking who benefits most from it, who doesn't benefit, and what are the other costs? Well, the math is simple, and this is something the students get right away. For every $1,000 of, of premiums that are not gonna be taxed, if you would have been taxed, and you think about tax rates running from 10% to 39.6% today, if you would have been taxed at the 39.6%, on that $1,000, you save $396. If you would have been taxed at the 10% rate, you save only $100. And if that premium had added, been added to your income, but your income is so modest, you wouldn't have been taxed anyway, you save nothing. So that's the, that's the dollars and cents. But employers typically provide, as you know, much larger policies for uh, the executives, for top management. I wrote an op-ed some years ago about Goldman Sachs. It provided premiums of $40,000 a year. I think if they felt they were gonna sneeze, they were covered. $40,000 a year for their top 400 managers. These are the top income earners in the world, among the top. And they each saved at the time roughly $14,000 a year in taxes, which was the cost of a basic policy, essentially the government giving them a basic policy through this exclusion. Now this also produces a, a concept that I think is really important of double losers. Who are the double losers here? Well, these are employees who work for companies and millions of Americans do, who don't provide any health insurance at work. They're too, they make a little too much money to get Medicaid and they have to go out in the marketplace and buy their health insurance but because the huge exclusion for health insurance drives up the price of health insurance and the cost of all health care, they have to pay more for all of that because others get the benefit of this enormous exclusion. Now the Affordable Care Act has helped, but it's only tempered this outcome. So here are a couple of policy questions I leave with you. Why should the government provide the greatest tax savings for health insurance premiums for the people with the highest incomes who could afford to buy those policies without any government assistance. Secondly, why should the government ever subsidize a health insurance policy other than a basic one? So now let me turn to the second, the most sacred deduction, and you all know it, and you know that it's in the Constitution. It must be the home mortgage interest deduction. Somewhere in the Second Amendment, it must be there. <clears throat> Now the home mortgage interest deduction allows people to deduct the interest on up to $1 million of loans to buy a principal or build a principal residence and or a vacation home. So you could borrow $650,000 to uh, buy your principal residence, $350,000 to buy a vacation home and deduct all the interest on that. Now the public is encouraged to believe that the home mortgage interest deduction is absolutely essential to increase the number of homeowners, particularly ordinary homeowners, and that it strengthens the economy. But as in The Wizard of Oz, let's peek behind the rhetorical curtain and really look at this decision, which is really the third rail in Congress. They won't touch it. Now, the deduction is expected to save certain taxpayers over the next five years $400 billion. That's a big program. So let's imagine, I know that you all have imagination, that's why you're here, 
that Congress eliminated the mortgage interest deduction even later. Oh, you can't hear, though. That's awful. So, imagine I'm over there. Um, <laughs> that it eliminated the deduction, but it authorized HUD, Housing and Urban Development, to issue $400 billion of checks tax-free to all the people who would have got the deduction in exactly the same amount of their tax savings. So they end up in the same position the government is out $400 billion. And imagine that it's a Monday morning, in fact, this morning, and I'm the chair of the House Ways and Means Committee, something I've always wanted to be. <clears throat> and I'm going to tell you how proud we are for the distribution of that $400 billion. And down the middle of there will be the bottom half of all taxpayers. I apologize, but you on the right, you're the top half of all taxpayers. And the Five of you, including Mr. Freeman, you're included. You're in the top 5%. And the students in the top 5% always smile. You can see it. And the people over here always look grim. In any event, here's how the $400 billion is allocated. I'm really happy to tell you. 2% goes to the bottom half of all taxpayers. You get $8 billion. The other $392 billion goes to the top half of all taxpayers. And to you five, and he's putting up his, his thumb. To you, f top 5%, you get 40% or $160 billion over the next five years so you can buy and build that house of your, of your pleasure. That's 20 times what the bottom half of all taxpayers get. Now, if this were on television, you would think maybe it's Saturday Night Live. But it isn't. That's exactly how approximately how that $400 billion will be distributed over the next five years. And it has real repercussions. First of all, there's the myth that it creates more homeowners. In fact, England, Canada, and Australia have no home mortgage interest deduction, nothing like it. And they have the same, roughly the same ownership of homes as we do. In fact, some have, have a higher percentage. Secondly, it mainly helps people buy and build bigger homes than they would do otherwise, not a basic home. It drives up the prices of homes. This is no freebie. You know if you lost your home mortgage interest deduction that the price of your home would go down. So you're paying for it. It, it, isn't, it isn't free money. And most interesting, both liberal and conservative economists say that our economy would be stronger, not weaker if less of our capital were allocated to home ownership, particularly expensive homes, so that more capital would be available at lower interest rates to new businesses, to existing business, to expand, to add jobs, etc. Now, who might be the double losers? Well, how about renters? Now, there's not a lot of research on this, but just think of the common sense. If so much capital is allocated to home ownership, then less capital presumably is allocated to apartments, to places that you can rent. Now, renters absolutely have much less income than homeowners, on average. So they effectively have to pay higher rent than they would otherwise pay because of these huge subsidies for homeowners who have much more income to begin with to pay for their, 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 their uh, housing costs. So as Mr. Freeman says, what should Congress do? Um, well, the leading tax commissions under the Bush administration and under the Obama administration have concluded that we should reduce many of them, eliminate the really inefficient ones, the unfair ones, um, and, and expose more income to tax and make more sense out of all this. You know what happened. Congress ignored it. But as Mr. Freeman said, they, a, a fair and sensible income tax is worth fighting for. Such reforms should be done over time, so not to totally disrupt the economy. But if Congress moved in that direction, more people would pay in accordance with their ability to pay. And they would save and work and invest in ways that produce the greatest economic return rather than focusing on their tax savings. And assuming the government, and there's some things that should be in the tax laws, the earned income tax credit is a, is, a, is a wonderful example. So assuming that some social and economic provisions ought to be in the tax laws, let's think about tax credits. Every dollar of tax credit saves you one dollar. It doesn't matter what your marginal tax bracket is. So if you owe a thousand dollars and you get a thousand dollar tax credit, you don't owe anything. If you owe a million dollars, 
you owe a million minus $1,000. Now, the tax credits also should be refundable in many cases where they are social uh, programs because a refundable tax credit, like the earning of tax credit, which says that people who are working but don't earn a living wage are going to get extra money to help them have a living wage. And so if you make it refundable, if you don't owe the income tax, you'll get a direct grant. Uh, both commissions uh, said that about the home mortgage interest tax, replace it by a credit. And Congress ignored that. Finally, you might have the largest credits for people who need the help most and the least credits for people who need the help least. So this is how I end my talk with the students, and I end it with you. I say to them, I hope that some of you are brave enough, if you're at a political rally, and I hope you go to the political rallies, and you hear a politician say, I'm going to propose a new deduction to help ordinary workers, you hardworking workers, that you'll raise your hand and you'll say, why are you proposing a tax break that saves the most money for people with the highest income who need the assistance least and the least tax savings for people with low and moderate incomes who need the assistance most? Thank you very much. All right, to introduce our next speaker, I believe Mr. Nader will be returning. Is that right? Thank you, uh, John Fox. In fact, we have copies of your 10 questions that politicians don't want to answer. We can uh, give them out, especially to the Hood College students who have arrived. And, uh, and, and are, are going to demonstrate they have the highest attention span of all college students in the country today. No smartphones. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce Joan Claybrook, who has worked on the Congress uh, for almost 50 years. The Congress is the most powerful instrument of our democracy to transform our country. Just look at the power it has in the Constitution, the power to tax, the power to spend, the power of oversight and investigation, uh, the power to confirm nominations for the courts and high executive branch officials, and many other powers. They also have the eye of the media, and that's why we all have to pay attention to the Congress it does spend about 22% of our income, and what it does and doesn't do can either ennoble the country or get the country in a lot of trouble, like the criminal invasion of Iraq, which the Congress punted to the White House in 2003. The people are supposed to be sovereign. Uh, the Constitution starts with we the people, not we the Congress or we the corporation. And yet, 1,500 or so corporations give or take, pretty much control a majority of the Congress on many issues that affect everybody, health, safety, economic well-being, environment. And so there's this gap between the constant pressure by thousands of lobbyists on Capitol Hill every day and uh, the withdrawal of most of the people in this country from holding their members of Congress accountable. There are only 535 of them. 100 senators, 435 members of the House. They put their shoes on every day, like you and I. And uh, as Warren Buffett once said, we're 300 million people. How come we can't control 535 uh, elected politicians? Now, the, the, uh, what Joan has done, and she's going to demonstrate this, is uh, show how a citizen lobbyist uh, can go up on Capitol Hill and get things done. What does the citizen lobbyist, environmental, consumer, labor, whatever, what do they bring to senators and representatives? They bring a set of facts documenting perils or corruption or what have you. They bring uh, their own determination and creativity and strategy. They bring 
uh, a reflection of public opinion, uh, majority of public opinion like safe cars, they like clean air, they like clean water, sort of a left-right lung issue and, and, and so forth. Uh, and, um, and, and they bring the ability to selectively pick your allies where they are in Congress in strategic committee locations and so forth to get a foothold. So what are these citizen groups up against? They're up against corporations who have far more lobbyists outnumbering the citizen lobbyists. The drug companies at one time when they were pushing the drug benefit bill had 450 full-time lobbyists going up on Capitol Hill. 450. And that's only the drug industry. Uh, they have a lot of money, they pour it into PACs. They have a lot of persistence. Uh, their job depends on their success uh, in, in Congress. They have their own specialized media, like the, the Chamber of, of Congress. Uh, and they are able to offer jobs to congressional staff or members of Congress after they leave the Congress, which is a very uh, little appreciated tool that, that they have. Now, you're going to hear um, how one citizen lobbyist uh, actually dealt with this mountain of opposition and on more than a few occasions prevailed. She was the longtime president of Public Citizen. Before that, she ran Public Citizen's Congress Watch. She did work on Capitol Hill. Uh, but when she goes up on Capitol Hill, uh, equipped with those items that I just mentioned. Um, senators from both sides have a hard time ignoring her. So I want to introduce what the auto companies once called the Dragon Lady, Joan Claybrook. <laughs> 